I'm really fired up for tonight. This is someone that I'm just meeting, but I've heard about for a long time. And again, this course is, is more about mindset than skill set, right? We, we, we ask people how they did it, but we're more interested in the why. You know, how do you set audacious goals? How do you align your behavior and your thoughts and your actions and your self-talk with that? And so when I, the more I read about Naveen, the more excited I was like, this is perfect for our class. Um, Naveen Jain is an entrepreneur and philanthropist driven to solve the world's largest challenges through innovation. He dreams big dreams and draws, people's, draws people to his efforts through the strength of his vision and his personality. He specializes in moonshots, figuratively and literally. Naveen emigrated from India and has founded at least seven companies, including Infospace, Intellius, Moon Express, and Viome. He also serves on the boards of the XPRIZE Foundation and Singularity University. Let's explore how to dream big and take action. Please welcome Naveen Jain. Naveen. Thank you, sir. Have a seat. Welcome, welcome. All right. Great to have you here. Is this your first time talking at USC or have you been here before? Uh, I don't think I've been at USC. I've done most other, most other colleges. <laughs> Well, this so, is, I saved the best one for the last. Uh, well, this, is, you're, this isn't the last one, that's, that's for true. sure. But um, we're glad you're here. Thank you. And uh, we, we do think this USC is a pretty special place right now to, to be an entrepreneur. I'm partial to Stanford, just my two kids are there. So. <laughs> that's okay. We, we love them too. And uh, in fact, um, probably as we speak, our basketball team's probably beating them in the Galen Center oh. right now. Isn't it? <laughs> Let's hope. Let's hope. We play tonight. <laughs> we play tonight. Always a uh, great rival uh, for us. Um, but welcome to USC. Are you, are you local or are you Northern California? Actually, I'm in Seattle. Oh, Seattle. Yeah. Great city. Great. I'll be there. Uh, I'll be there on February 12th. I want you to look me up. I'll then. dial you in. I'm uh, going up there for a, a charitable event with Will Farrell and, and Pete Carroll. So we'll invite oh, you yeah, to that. It'll be, yeah. It'll be fun. It'll be fun. It wasn't a name drop. It's just like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Um, but it's great to have you here. And as, as I mentioned, this course is about. Um, about mindset, it's called the entrepreneurial mindset, taking the leap, mm -hmm. and uh, and you more than anyone sort of typifies that. So let's let's just start there before we dive into your 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 upbringing and family life. Let's talk about um, mindset. Mm -hmm. um, when you start determining or evaluating an opportunity, whether it's a worthy challenge for you, what do you look for? I mean. The main thing is, before you start something, assume that it is going to be successful. You, so you start something and says, God forbid, it actually works, <laughs> right? Then what would it mean? Is it going to move the needle? Is it going to change the lives of a billion people someday if I'm actually successful in doing what I'm doing? And if it doesn't, your life is worth a lot more. Don't waste your time on doing something that is not going to move the needle on the universe, right? So find something that you're truly passionate about. And how do you know, how, you know, people always say, I don't know what my passion is, you know, what do I do? And I think it's really easy to find your true passion. Think about what is it that you're willing to die for and then live for it. And or other way of thinking about that is, if you had everything that you want in your life, the billions of dollars you wanted, the amazing family, and everything that you care about, what would you do? And if you do that today, you will get everything that you always wanted. This is a process where you can't focus on the end goal. You have to learn to enjoy the journey. And the only way you're gonna enjoy the journey is to actually be some, doing something that means a lot. It is a tough road. Anytime you start something, don't let someone tell you it is going to be easy. There is very few overnight successes. In fact, most overnight success, as David probably taught you, probably take about 10 years, right? These, these overnight successes are years and years of hard work. And, and also know that during that time, you're gonna see plenty of ups and downs. So I really, you know, David and I were talking about it offline, and I say, you know, life of an entrepreneur is really like a heartbeat. It goes up and down. When it's flat, you're dead. So you never want a smooth line. If things are going really good for you, you are dead. You already are dead. You just don't know yet. Right? <laughs> when it's going up and down is really what 
what really differentiates between a good entrepreneur and a great entrepreneur. When things are really, really bad and you think that, you know, nothing is in the life is going to ever work, I am just about to give up. Just know, if you survive through that winter, the next beat is up. And when you are on the top of the game, don't get too cocky, you know the winter is coming, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right. So point is never ever get too comfortable where you are and never get too depressed when the things are bad. It's all the cycle. And, and you know, the ups and downs, like, look, there are a lot of very successful people coming through here and we're going to get people younger that are on the way up and we'll have people, look, a lot of people like to talk about their successes. We're going to talk about failures too and setbacks and learning because, you know, there really is no success without some failure. And you want to have a conversation, you're going to keep that here. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 I, I don't need it. Uh, that's perfect. And uh, so uh, I don't need it. Trust me. Oh yeah. He Trust me. I, 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 I did my homework. Uh -huh. um, so, but there, there is no success without failure. Um, and as, as he said, the ups and downs, yeah. there's no such thing as going undefeated as an entrepreneur. So it's, it really is, uh, what is a failure and as an entrepreneur, do you actually fail, right? So my, my thought process goes like this. You as an entrepreneur should be dreaming so big that people think you are absolutely freaking crazy, right? When you tell someone what you are about to be doing and if they don't think it's a crazy idea, you're not thinking big enough. Right. So when people ask me, what would you be doing? And I say, I'm going to mine the moon. They say, that's a fucking crazy idea. <laughs> you know you're onto something. And when you are actually done the moonshot, what do you do next for an encore? You do another moonshot. And what do you do in a moonshot? My second moonshot I'm going to talk about is just simply just give you an idea how crazy can you be. I'm going to create a world where illness could be a matter of choice, not a matter of bad luck. People will only be sick because they want to be sick, not because they have to be sick. People who say, that's a Who wants to be sick? Actually, every day people make that choice. You tell people, don't eat that French fries, it's not good for you. That's they true. make a choice. So point is, I can only tell you what is good for you, and it's not about healthy diet. So just, I'll, I'm gonna tell you, uh, like smoking is a pretty good example. Everyone knows it's written in a bold letter. If smoking is bad for you. If you smoke, you're gonna get a cancer. You take a cigarette out and you smoke. <laughs> That's the choice you make, right? However, if you tell, it's very interesting how um, you know, life works. People don't want good health. People want good life. They think smoking gives them a good life. They don't care for good health, right? You tell them you're gonna have a cancer if you smoke, they don't care. You tell them you become important when you smoke, they take the cigarette and you snub it out. <laughs> right? They want good life, right? So coming, <laughs> back, coming back to it, the failure only happens when you give up. Everything else is just a pivot. An idea that you have may or may not work. And every idea that does not work is simply a stepping stone to a different idea and a bigger idea and a better idea. So that human beings fail and entrepreneurs pivot. And let's, I want to step back to, you know, you started talking about passion and how you sort of engage yourself. But we want, I want to give them a framework and even a process, not that there's a magic formula. But let's start with, um, you know, when you have an idea or a concept, and, and in Naveen's case saying, you know, you want to set things so audaciously that people say you're crazy. You know, there's a, what's the, there's a, a German philosopher, was it Schopenhauer, who says the three phases of truth. First, it's um, ridiculed. The second phase, it's violently opposed. And the third is it's, it's accepted as self-evident. Yes. And that's sort of the way things go when people take outlandish uh, goals. But let's start with you know, the, when you ask yourself questions and you start setting your goals or your dreams, um, you know, Simon Sinek who came and spoke, you know, he has a book called Start With Why, mm -hmm. and you talk about purpose and meaning. Mm -hmm. And you have to find something that moves you through all the ups and downs and heartbeats mm -hmm. and things like that, and it has to be why. And the first thing that will happen when someone says, I wanna mine the moon, mm -hmm. I wanna cure all disease, I wanna start a new social platform, you, you name it, people will say, how? Yes. How are you going to do that? 
you don't have the experience, you don't have the money, you don't have the smarts, you don't have the team. Everybody wants to defeat you with how. And if you start asking yourself how questions right out of the gate, mm -hmm. you're going to walk your goals backwards. You're, they're not going to be big enough for you. And if you know every step along the way mm -hmm. in, your, in your goals, what, what does that mean? If I know every step along the way, what does that mean? So I think, uh, so first of all, I mean, I have personally in a great example, and I can tell you that. Once you know something and you are really good at it and you become an expert, you're more or less useless at that point, right? Because the people who actually know things, they can only improve it incrementally. They can make it better by 10% or 15%. So if you know how, then you can make it better by 10% or 15%. If you want to change something 10 times or 100 times, you have to come from complete as a non-expert. You can't have any background in that industry. The reason if you become an expert, the only way to become an expert, to have a foundational knowledge that you take it for granted. Because if you challenge it, you're no longer an expert. So you have to say, I don't know anything about it, and that's the reason I'm going to be the most dangerous person that industry has ever seen. So not knowing something is the biggest strength you have. I started Moon Express. I have no idea about rocket science, and I can tell you about how that went about. When I started healthcare, I had absolutely no idea about healthcare. And today, every healthcare company knows I'm one of the most dangerous guys they have ever seen because they have no idea because I'm unpredictable. They have no idea where I'm going to go next. <laughs> right? What am I going to change next? How am I going to disrupt that next? They never thought healthcare could be delivered directly to consumer because that's not something they ever thought some crazy person would do. Right? And that's what the crazy people do. Now, coming back to the process is, even though your dreams are massive, you're dreaming so audacious thing, you have no idea how to achieve them. What you do is, you take a slice at a time. You say, this is what I'm going to do first. And when that works, I'm going to take the next slice. So you keep slicing the thing out, and you can start to build the whole dream. Amazing things also is, when you're trying to do something so audacious that is going to actually move the humanity forward, amazing things happen. The people around the world will come together to help you get that done. When you tell someone, I'm going to build an iPhone app that's going to help you find a roommate, they say, great idea, go do it. Good luck. They don't care. When you tell someone, what if we can together can create a world where no one ever has to be sick, everyone start to say, I want to be part of that goal. And I can tell you that the day I announced that, we have no idea what I was going to do. I said, <laughs> we are going to make illness optional. And I went on CNBC. I was talking about a moonshot. And I said, my next moonshot is I'm going to make illness as an option, where people don't have to be sick as a matter of choice. They can only be, there is no bad luck here. They only be sick because they made a choice to be sick. Amazing things happen. I got a call from the head of the IBM Watson Research. He said, I've been working on AI to look at all the biological data. I want to come and help you because that's the problem. I've been plenty successful in life. I want to do something that's really significant. Second call I got was this woman called Dr. Helen Massier. PhD in microbiology. She is an MD, functional medicine doctor, working for Craig Venter on human longevity. She said, I've been working on this whole problem of human longevity. What's the point living longer if people are going to be sick anyway? Let me come and help you solve this problem of sickness. I can do that. The third interesting thing was I was at Los Alamos National Lab. You know what Los Alamos National Lab is famous for? Anyone here? Department Atomic of, bomb. Department of Energy. No, oh, atomic yeah. bomb. That's where they developed They it. built the atomic bomb. It's, used to, it's called Manhattan Project. It wasn't done in Manhattan. It was done in Los Alamos, New Mexico. Interesting thing is, these guys are doing some of the hardcore national security work. They were working on a biodefense technology. And th imagine what the biodefense technology looks like. They wanted to figure out if their bad actor were to get hold of something crazy like biological things, how would we ever know what's making us sick? So they spent billions of dollars trying to figure out if something happened, how can we very quickly find out what is going on inside the body that's making people sick? When I saw the technology, I'm thinking, if they know how to make what's making people sick, why can't I take that technology and keep people healthy? The interesting thing was, the person who was working on it, he says, 
I, I'm going to quit my job and help you do that. Now I have an amazing team and a technology that is doing this work. Every venture capital start to call. What are you doing? What are these people coming and joining you for? I am, have this amazing, audacious goal. We want to invest in the company. And minutes you tell them, I don't need the money, is the amazing things happen. The minute you tell them, I don't need the money, it's like raising a red flag in front of the bull. They are just mad. What do you have that is so goddamn valuable that you're not even willing to share with me when I'm giving you money? Just don't need the money. right? They will give you money at any cost, at any valuation, as much as you want, or more than what you want. So if you tell them, look, I really don't need it, but if you really insist, I'll take five million. Would you please consider taking 10? <laughs> nah, 10 is too much. <laughs> right? They ended up giving 15. <laughs> right? I'm not kidding you. It's an amazing thing see, when you play the game right, people come to you. Because when you go to them, they think you need it. Let them come to you. And you, they will come. Don't you worry. They all will come because you make enough noise. The last thing they want is to miss out in the next Facebook. right? So if you, go, you are in front of a VC, let me tell you how that goes. If you come with a conviction and that says, I am going to do this until my last drop of blood. If they see that conviction that you're willing to die for it, and if they know that if it is actually successful, it is going to move the mil billion people, it's going to be a massive enterprise, they don't want to miss out, and their fear of missing out is bigger. And I, in fact, told one of the VCs, you don't have to invest in it. But when you say no, you know you're going to be a poster child when I actually make this happen to say, that guy said no. <laughs> You don't want to be that guy to be on the cover of every magazine that said no. It they don't like that. It, it's, it, it, all of it, it, it helps to have a couple wins under your belt, obviously, oh, um, where your people have, have either made money off you or missed out before. Um, but, but some great lessons in there, all of those. Yeah, the best way to invite people is to not invite them. The best way to raise money is to not ask. You have to build these relationships before you need the money, because right. when you need the money, it's blood in the water. Um, and then the other thing, the other two things I noticed is that he breaks down his vision so simply that everybody can understand it and feel an emotional reaction, right? I'm going to mine resources and colonize the moon. You're like, whoa, whoa, I've seen that before. I've seen it on TV. You know, like that's something that moves you. I'm going to make illness optional. I mean, that's, that's so concise and so powerful. And then the other part is, you know, he, he has a larger megaphone in terms of like being able to get on TV and things like that. But um, Adam Chire, do you know Adam? Oh, Adam so, so who created Siri. He's got this very, you know, sort of uh, developed framework and he calls it, uh, you know, once you set your goals, um, he calls them verbally stated goals. Once you believe them with all your heart, then he goes and tells everybody. One, it ties you, it makes you accountable. So do you really believe? And actually, what I'm going to tell you about Adam, one of the things I'm not sure he told you the story about uh, when they started Siri. When they started Siri, it was pretty obvious that there was not enough bandwidth or enough processing power that could actually make Siri work. And you know what his answer was? I know it's going to be three, four years before the technology actually exists. But who thinks I'm going to be ready for another three or four years anyway? And the amazing thing was they kept building, the technology kept growing. And the lesson there was, when you find the technology that's on the exponential curve, you watch where the knee of the curve is. And if you can find, you never want to be where the puck is. You want to be where the puck is going to be. So if you watch a soccer player, the fifth grader always are chasing the ball. And if you look at the uh, World Cup soccer game, the best players stand where the ball is going to be, not where the ball is. And that's really the amazing thing when you're building a company. Don't look at what the today's technology will do. You start thinking about where the curve is, where the technology is headed, and if it's going to take you two or three years to build it, you see in three years from now what technology will exist that will solve this problem. Yeah, you, you know, especially as a startup. If you're a 20, 22-year-old startup, 
there are already players in that space. By the time you get 10% better, they've lapped you. So you really have to be looking two, three, four, five years ahead to see where you fit into the landscape. I was going to just, <coughs> just say a little bit more about the people who are competition and the number of people who are in the industry. Great point. So amazing things is that it used to be people will say, oh, my idea, someone else is already working on it, or they already have four or five years ahead of me. How am I going to go compete with that? And the interesting thing that I find is the technology is moving at such a fast pace. Anything that people are doing today is going to be obsolete in four to five years or five to seven years. That means if they are already five years ahead of you, they're two years before dying. Right. That means you now have an edge over them that you start with the latest technology that exists today, you are already five years ahead of them in terms of the technological curve. Right. So that is the something you have to learn is never get disappointed just because others are doing it. You need to come in and say, they've been doing it for seven years, that's the old technology. I can go out and beat the shit out of them by using the latest technology. <laughs> And, and, and we do get the shit. We know a lot about shit, I can tell you that. <laughs> and there's another thing about competition that, that if you truly are looking at, at, at big things, big things, things that no one's done before, people, <clears throat> there is less competition in that stratosphere. Now, it's not easy to get there. It's not easy to sort of make progress on it. But, you know, you, you want to be a lawyer? There's plenty of competition. People going through law schools and getting big jobs and you know, big firms. But if you want to, like, do elite things, there are fewer players up there. And you know, a lot of the innovations are sometimes they are technological innovation, and a lot of the time they're really the business model innovation. So don't really think of innovation that, hey, I am not a scientist, how am I gonna innovate anything? You innovate by taking the existing things and by bundling them together, you create something totally new. So you can take the commodity stuff and by packaging it right, you create something totally new. I mean, if you look at the car, every car is same thing. It's built out of plastic and glass and you know steel. How you put them together is what makes a Ferrari a Ferrari, and you can the same I think makes a Yugo. So you can have a Yugo, you can have a Ferrari. It's the same thing. Plastic, steel, and <laughs> glass. <laughs> Do they still have Yugos? Oh, those are gone. <laughs> you don't get my point. <laughs> we got. <laughs> like those did die. Um, well, let's let's let's. Um, can we talk a little bit about your background? Just because we have USC is, you know, the first or second most internationally diverse university in the country. You know, I, I, want, I don't want to talk about myself. I want to talk about them. So I'm going to focus on what can I do while we have time to see how I can help you, what you're trying to do. Because, you know, my life, you know, is really good. So I'm here to give back to you. <laughs> it didn't come out right, so I'm going to talk about my life now. No, no, no. <laughs> so th right. th there'll, be, there'll be a chance for that. It, it, look, it, it'd be tough to have one-on-ones with 300 people, just like, hey, what are you working on? What do you want to do? That, that but let's try some. But, but we're, we're, they're going to have a chance to talk. Th no, they're going to have a chance to, to ask you questions. And, and so okay. well, let's, let's frame right. it with your business a little bit then. If you, if you don't want to talk about your background, that's fine. Um, I don't mind talking about it, just that uninteresting. I mean, you know, this is the you know, story of a typical immigrant, right? You have nothing, you come from nothing, you don't speak the language. <laughs> yeah, you know? I mean, it's just an immigrant story, it's, it's a sob story, right? Oh, I didn't have food to eat. I didn't have a place to stay. I, you know, I'm a slumdog millionaire. Came here, life has, <laughs> <laughs> life has been good. Yeah, so that's me, <laughs> the American dream, right? <laughs> hey, not far from it. Well, that covers it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it, there. There are some things to actually pull from that, but you know, coming here, not speaking the language, and and. You, you didn't have any money when you came, yes, right? that's right. So you know, people like to, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about, you know, sure. Americans work harder than anybody or the hardest working people. You know, you know who the hardest working people are? Desperate mm -hmm. people. Well, people that don't have a safety net. So I think I'm going to maybe just take a little bit of the back part of the story about what, why do I do what I do today? What gets me excited to come here and say I'm going to take two hours of my life and come sit here and talk to people that I don't know, right? And this is really is why I do that. Um, so as, uh, as you can imagine, um, came with nothing. And society and everyone embraced me with an open heart, with open arms. And I look at the, any which way you look at it, if I may say God has been very kind to us. And you look back, and there are many times I you know, remember the people who helped me, and I call them, what can I do for you? 
And the answer is, I don't need anything. And that's probably one of the worst thing you ever want to hear, that you have a debt that you owe to someone, and they don't want anything back from you. So you have that debt on your shoulder. You're trying to figure out how to pay your debt back to the society that you have. And the only way I found that I can pay back is to pay forward. The people who helped me don't need my help, so I'm going to dedicate my life to helping as many people as I can and hope they will have exactly the same feeling when they become successful to go out and pay forward. And that's the reason I go do everything I do is to move the humanity forward, help as many young people as I can. Because when I came here, I was your age. Right? So I was your age, I was 20, 22, didn't know anything. People just embraced me. People helped me. And if I don't do that to someone else, I am actually become very selfish that I took the elevator up and I took the key and threw it off. I want to send the elevator back and bring as many people back up as I can. And that's the reason I'm here. That's a, so you know we talk about how to measure success yep. and failure and how do you how do you how do you how do you monitor whether you're on the right path and successful and so some people may say I track it in money I track it in service or a big so house so how, you know yours has all been in framed with impact so success is never about how much money you have in the bank success will be measured by how many lives you've been able to improve uh, success is not you're not going to, you know, you will know when you are successful, very simple formula. The day you become humble is the day you become successful. If you still have iota of arrogance left in you, that means you're still trying to prove something to someone else or to yourself. When you have to tell someone, you know how much money I have, or you have to tell someone how big my hand is, you, you know. <laughs> I'm not talking about our president. <laughs> You are really not successful. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's true, and if you, if you knew that earlier in life, that that uh, if you're trying, you know, if, if you're sort of chasing that, <coughs> it, it just takes probably decades. If I knew it when I was 20, you'd be far, you know. You'd, you'd and actually, you know, life. it's interesting that when you talk to young people, I mean, how do you ever understand that it's really not about money? Making money is a byproduct of doing things that you love. And the best way I can explain is, it's like having sex. If you, you, know, if you focus on orgasm, you'll never get it. <laughs> so just enjoy the process. So, so think about making money is like having an orgasm. Just don't focus on it. <laughs> so, you, you, and, and look, some of this stuff is useful because, because it frames, like at 20 and 22, it's harder to put yourself in the shoes, but you, you did sort of come here. What, just I'm going to actually explain a little bit more. I have three children, and the best thing I can tell you is I'm going to give you the advice that I gave them, and I think I'm going to just give you through their life because everything that I'm telling you is how I, essentially what they have done, because our oldest is now 27, our daughter is 23, and our youngest one is 20. 21. <coughs> our, our oldest graduated from Stanford, uh, from Wharton, and, le and last two are from at Stanford. Uh, so I can tell you some really interesting story about uh, when my oldest one was 10 years old. Um, at that point, born in 92,000, I'm running my first company, Infospace, and it was worth about $35 billion at that time. I came home from an interview, and he comes to me and says, you know what, Dad? I'm going to make more money than you, than you have. I could have easily put my arms around his neck and said, good luck, son. <laughs> but I didn't, because that would have been ultimately what he chased for the rest of his life. I sat him down, and I said, Uncle, I'm so surprised you think of success in that way. I want you to be super successful. And if you are able to change more people's life than I ever did, I'll be just so proud of you. You know what he said? Whatever, Dad. <laughs> but it's amazing. He's 10 years old. He says, whatever, Dad, and walks out. Now he is 17 years old, a sophomore, uh, 18, a sophomore at Wharton. Calls me one day and says, you know what, Dad, I've been thinking. And I say, what? <clears throat> he say, I'm going to start an organization. That, you know, I've been going around all the friends I'm meeting at different colleges. 
brilliant, brilliant students, they all come from middle class background and they just didn't have the mentors like you provided the mentors. Today I feel I had the best mentors in my life. I want to create something where I'm going to bring all the mentors like I had for them. And he started something called Kairos Society, K-A-I-R-O-S, right? How many of you are Kairos member here? You. So interesting thing is, he started when he was 17 or 18, and now it's been 10 years. Amazing things happen. He said that by helping these people around the world become successful is how I'm going to improve lives of more people than you ever did. That kid who says whatever dad, remember the goal, what he wanted to achieve. So what the lesson really is, despite what the kids tell you, when they know what will make you proud of, what the parents will be proud of, they always do what makes pr parents proud of. Second thing I told him was that your self-worth is never going to be about how much, what you own and how much you own. It is going to be about what you create. So if you own a lot but you haven't created anything, you are still a piece of shit as far as society is concerned, <laughs> right? You are still a parasite on humanity because you haven't created anything. So you look at all these guys in the Middle East who own a lot, but they're still a goddamn piece of shit for as far as society is concerned, right? <laughs> because they haven't created anything yet, right? So remember, so <clears throat> the lessons we were teaching them were about the simple values of what we stand for. And if you haven't seen him, he was, last week he was on CNBC and Fox talking about how Silicon Valley has lost its soul. And he went out and saying, why is it the brightest of the people in the Silicon Valley, when you go to CES, are building the Alexa-enabled toilets, Alexa-enabled toaster, Alexa, flush toilet. Is that the biggest problem that's facing the humanity? He says, here we have a society, the kids are graduating with a $1.5 trillion debts. The kids cannot live in New York with you know, paying 60% of their income on the house. Why is no one fixing the real problem by faced by the real people? Why aren't people focused on the actual problems that is there? There are trillions of dollars of problems that actually exist instead of building this $700 juicer. But I highly encourage you to go watch his talk because I think you'll just love it. So his name is Ankur, A-N-K-U-R, last name is same Jen. <laughs> Interesting thing is, Imagine now his sister growing up that this kid is now out there, everyone. So he's in the cover of Inc. magazine, he's a full page profile on LA Times, full page profile on Wall Street Journal, he's everywhere. And the little girl growing under, and she's thinking, how am I ever going to be successful looking at my brother? And it's really hard because they have two choices at that point. To say, I'm going to go out and make that happen and be better than that, or says, I could have been but I just didn't want to and they completely go in a different direction. Interesting thing was I started to work with her and saying, you know, I call her my doll, so it's really interesting. So I said, sweetie, you really need, you can be what you want to be. And she came to me one day. <clears throat> and the reason I'm trying to tell you is that something, hopefully it will resonate with you. When she was 17 years old, she came to me and said, Dad, I have found, I know my true passion. I know what I want to do with my life. And, um, and I say, sweetie, you're too young to have a passion. Because the easiest answer for me to say is, what's your passion? I want you to pursue your passion, right? And I say, sweetie, you're too young to have a passion. I haven't exposed you to enough things yet that you don't even know what you don't know. She said, Dad, I know, I know you want me to have, go to science and technology. I absolutely do not want to do that. So how do you deal with that? So I says, you know, how about this? We do one thing. I want you to go to Singularity University. I want you to learn about nanotechnology, neuroscience, genetics, and, and I want you to learn about all these technologies. And if you spend four weeks learning about them with an open mind, wanting to learn and wanting to like, and if you promise me that, when you come back, whatever it is you want to do, I will support it. And says, Dad, if you give me your word, I'm going to go out there with an open mind and go do that. She comes back. Four weeks later, opens the door and said, Dad, I made up my mind. My first words are, oh, shit. <laughs> I said, sweetie, I gave you my word. What is it that you would like to do? He said, Dad, I want to be either a neuroscientist or a genetist. <laughs> I took a deep breath. I said, at the risk of you changing your mind, can you tell me what actually happened? He said, Dad, you're just so dumb. OK, so tell me what. 
He said, Dad, I'm in high school, and I am now, I go to these science classes, and they put the chemicals together, they teach me these things. I'm thinking, why do I really care? When am I going to use this in my life? When I went to Singularity University, I, I know my passion is helping women. And I realize, how am I going to help women if I don't know how the human brain works? How am I going to help them with their health? I don't know anything about genetics. And I decided if I want to help women be successful and empower them, I need to know this. And the science and technology is simply the tools for me to do what I want. That's not a destination. Imagine that. That changed her life. And if I had simply allowed her to do what she wanted, not only she would have never found her true passion, the world would have lost out on a great, great person. Right? Now today, she's working on artificial intelligence and a gender equality. So her whole thing is the gender gap can only be filled when there is artificial intelligence removes all the gender bias. So they now work with Unilever, and the first time with the AI for recruiting, they had 300% increase in women and uh, minorities. Tell them how they did that. It's really fascinating. I'll come back. And so what they do is basically they uh, say, who are the most successful people in your organization? And they take and see what are the skills and what are the things they have. And then they develop the video games that are completely unbiased, not designed for men or the boys to be successful. They can be played by women or men, and no one knows who they are. And they get the assigned number. And they see all the skills. And when the employer is looking for someone to interview, they don't know who this person is. And they say, I want this person, this person, and this person. And when they do that, suddenly they find the best person was the woman. But they would have never, ever even asked for that interview. And in fact, very interesting, they had done multiple studies. They took identical resume and put in two different names to it. And one person got called, another one didn't get called. Identical. And that's simply the bias that we have. The humans, despite what we say, we are a pattern matching machine. Our brain matches a pattern. If a venture capitalist has funded the last 10 companies and eight of them have been successful and they were all Caucasian men, they're funding the next one, the Caucasian man. If everyone was funded that was successful was an Indian man, they're going to fund the next Indian man walks in. It's the pattern they find. Our youngest one is a junior at Stanford, and he's just amazingly coming through. His first public talk was a TED talk at United Nations. How and power of youth. Just listen to the talk. It's called power of youth. The young people are not the leaders of tomorrow. Young people are leaders of today. They are changing the world today. Now they are be positioned to be changing the world someday. Right? Because... You and I, for the first time in the human history, has a power to do things that only the superpowers did before. When you know, think about going to the moon, only three superpowers have ever landed in the moon. We, there's never a private company that has ever done that. When we land on the moon, not only we become the first private company to do so, symbolically we become the fourth superpower. Despite what you may hear that Elon or Jeff Bezos or Richard Branson are going to space, they're all stuck in the low Earth orbit. We are the only company in the universe that actually have a permission to leave Earth orbit and land on the moon. President Obama signed into the law that says anything we bring back, we get to own it. Who would have thought? Right? So amazing things happen. <clears throat> so lesson of entrepreneurship is when I started the company, I could have come up with the 10 reasons why this will never work. There is no department for approving the mission to the moon. How will we ever get the permission? We didn't think about that. How would we ever, even if we go there, we bring back all the stuff, wouldn't they confiscate it all? Would we have ever right? There is no law that says we get to own it. We didn't worry about that. We said we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And we did cross that bridge. And the beauty of life is, whenever you're moving forward, the lesson I can give you is when you cross the bridge, you burn the bridge behind you because there is no going back. If you know the bridge is still there, there is a tendency to go back when the times get tough. When you burn the bridge behind you, there is no going back. You only move forward. There is nothing else you can do. So, thank you. <laughs> Great. Great <point>. So, <coughs> so let's talk about Moon Express for a few minutes. You. Uh, you don't want to talk about health? We'll talk health. 
I'm just trying to give him a hard time. <laughs> I'm, I'm flexible on all this stuff. I'm flexible. So uh, on the moon, um, um, how, how, you know, how many people are on your team now? Where do you stand? And then where do you see it in the, ne the next year? I, I think this year you've got so, your, your first scout expedition. Is so we are going to launch, um, you know, in this environment, either later this year, or it might slip to next year, but it is definitely happening. Right. So we are going to launch the mission in the next 12 months. Imagine how close it is. We've been working in it for 10 years. 10 years ago when we started, people said it is going to cost at least billion dollars to get to the moon because when we did it the first time, it cost 10 billion dollars and it took a whole nation. In today's dollars, that will be about 100 billion dollars. And they say, maybe you guys are smart, you can do it for billion dollars. I was absolutely convinced we could do it for under 100 million dollars. Today we sit here because we knew the exponential technologies, we knew the cost of the structure will come down, the cost of the rockets will come down, the cost of the sensors, everything that's in the iPhone is exactly what we use in the uh, spacecraft. We knew the cost will come down and we thought we could do it for $100 million. Today we sit here and I'm going to tell you that cost is under $10 million. Right. So I thought I was 10 times optimistic bringing the cost from a billion to 100 million, guess what? I was 10 times pessimistic thinking it was going to be 100 million. It is 10 million or under 10 million, right? So that's the beauty of when you start to see that you're on the exponential curve. You don't know what is going to happen, but you know the cost will continue to come down. And even if it didn't come down as fast, we knew it was going to come down. The even of the first mission may not have been as profitable. We knew the subsequent mission will continue to get more and more profitable as the costs come down. So think about when the technology exists, what would you do as costs are coming down? You start to capture the market early with a minimal profit, knowing you're going to get extremely profitable. And you build, <coughs> you build the the gap and you build this core strength by owning the data, right? The data becomes the most valuable thing you have. And that brings me to the second venture uh, on the healthcare. So think about what did we do? <clears throat> In our country alone, we spend a trillion dollar every year on healthcare. And the more money we spend, the sicker our people are getting. So what is wrong with this picture? So I'm going to just give you a little bit of idea of a thought process about three examples. What time is it now? 7.03. 7.03. So we have time, right? Yeah. We're good. We're on time. I want to give you some examples of how to think about it. And then I want to open it up to Q&A. Because I really want you to start thinking about how. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, you don't like Q&A? Every time I say that, you guys don't want no, they're to excited. They're, they're, they're laughing because like, you're dictating when everything happens. That's what they're laughing at. <laughs> they're not laughing at you. They're, they're laughing at me. Oh, you were supposed to be the one moderating it. <laughs> oh, I forgot that. These are, the, these are the best classes for me. <coughs> I, my job is to flip the ball to you and to keep us on time. This is the easiest class no, for your me. job is to look good, smile. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first time someone said that, but I, I'm happy to try. But no, I don't want to interrupt your flow, no, so go back to, to the volume. So, so I was thinking, so as I was starting to finish up actually with uh, a moonshot of Moon Express, I start thinking about should I, what should be my next moonshot? And I start thinking about education or healthcare. And it turns out the problems are very similar in education and healthcare. How so? Both, in both cases, people believe the system is just not working. People believe the education is broken and the healthcare is broken. And it turns out neither one of them is actually broken. They're doing exactly what they were designed to do. Our needs are, have changed. <coughs> Our education system was designed to teach us skills, and we could use the skill for the rest of our life. And life was wonderful. In the world of exponential technologies, every skill that you learn becomes obsolete every five to seven years. In fact, more often than not, by the time you graduate, the skill you just learned is already obsolete. In that world, it's not the education system is broken. Our needs and the exponential technology requires that we don't teach skills anymore. We teach them learning to learn. We don't focus them on individual disciplines. We teach them the interdisciplinary skills. 
it's not going to be about how much you know. It is going to be about collaboration together of how to use interdisciplinary approach to solve a problem. So it becomes a problem solving exercise. The teacher doesn't need to be teaching you anything because everything that you need to know is already available on the internet and more modern and <coughs> latest technology than the teacher who is teaching you even knows. And a lot of the times, people who are up to the speed, they already know the thing what teacher is teaching about because the same notes from the two years ago is already old. And say, do you know the, <coughs> professor, do you know about the God particle? What is that thing? Well, go, go Google it. <laughs> <coughs> My point is, in the world where the, everyone listening to you already has all the information, what would the education system look like? Somebody's got to change that. And I thought I would do that. Until I start to look at the healthcare, and I'm starting to figure out, healthcare system was designed to cure infectious diseases because when it was designed, people were dying from infections. And it is amazing. I mean, th there is no better system in the world when you come to acute diseases, you get into the accident, you have infection, you're not going to die from that like you used to die. What's happening is, just like in our education system, since we are not teaching right, we have chronic unemployment, we have the chronic diseases. What is a chronic diseases? Chronic diseases is something that is constantly you are sick. Our healthcare system was designed for the episodic sickness. You are sick, you go there, and then you come back and life was good. It wasn't designed for constant sickness. It wasn't designed for the chronic diseases. <clears throat> and this turns out the chronic diseases have a common phenomena. It's a chronic inflammation. So chronic inflammation causes chronic diseases. However, our healthcare system has become so big that it has become an organism in itself. And when a system becomes organism, you know what happens? The survival of the system becomes the biggest goal. And the purpose goes out the window. Our system now has actually designed to keep you sick. If you have something novice, something novel, you know what it does? Like any other organism, it swallows the new thing it says, I've never seen it before. I'm going to release the immune system, the antibodies, and I'm going to kill this new technology before it starts to find something that will kill me. And that is what our healthcare system does. How does a doctor make money when you go and see him because you are sick? If he keeps you healthy, you become healthy and he becomes sick because he's making no money, right? <laughs> Pharmaceutical companies. They are designed to keep you sick. They love chronic diseases. That means subscription business. Subscription. <laughs> in fact, you know what one of the pharmaceutical company CEOs did on a conference call, an investor call? He said, the best drugs that we develop are the drugs that people have to take for the rest of their life. What he's saying is, the best drugs are the ones that keep people sick, not the ones that cure people. How does one stand in front of the mirror and not pull a trigger on the bullet and say, I'm going to kill myself, how pathetic I am? Right? That is our system. So I decided that system will change. It turns out <coughs> we as humans, and I'm going to tell you something that coming from outside the world, you're going to find it fascinating because I didn't know anything about healthcare. So here are the things I learned. We as humans, we have more foreign cells in our body than the human cells. Think about that for a second. When it comes to our genes, our genes only, our DNA produces 20,000 genes. And the foreign, foreign organisms in our body, they produce 2 million genes. That means we are less than 1% human. And we are walking, talking, microbial ecosystem. So I was trying to explain this, and most people, it just goes right over their head. So yesterday, I was uh, speaking at another event, and I came up with a theory of how to actually explain this. So I'm going to try this on you. I came up with a way, how, how, why were the, how were the humans created? How were we created? And I have a theory, how were the humans created? So on this planet, the bacteria and viruses have been around for 4 billion years. The humans are only about 200,000 years old. So here's what I think actually happened. About a million years ago, all these bacteria and viruses got together. 
And they said, we're sick and tired of living in this local area. We want to take over the world. And they all looked at each other. One wise man said, I think we can do that. You are the crazy guy. Tell me how. <clears throat> what if we create something that will carry us around? And you know what? All we have to do is keep this thing healthy. It's going to run around and feed us all the time. It's going to go out everywhere in the world. It's going to poop everywhere. It's going to spread us around. And we're going to take over the world. And humans were created. <coughs> now, the humans were not very intelligent at that point. The humans were just not very intelligent. Suddenly, they start to see this organism called human start to grow. And they got together again. He said, just like we are afraid of artificial intelligence, if this thing becomes smarter than us, what will happen to us? The one wise young millennial asked the guys, Sir, sir, look at this. You created this thing. It's going to one day become smarter than us. How are we going to live? Won't you think it's going to actually kill us? How are we going to survive? The master sat, nodded for a second. He said, don't you worry. You know what we did? One of our brothers is inside their cell. This is called mitochondria. Mitochondria used to be the ancient bacteria. Guess what? Not only our brother is inside their cell, it is the energy factory. The mitochondria provides energy. They go out of control. We shut the energy. They're gone. Everybody's happy. Master, you did a great job. Other guy sitting in the corner says, Master, Master, I have another question. What? They got this brain. One day it's going to get smarter. What are you going to do about that? I said, oh, you di didn't I tell you about that? We got this vagus nerve that goes all the way where we reside in the gut. We got this vagus nerve. Everything we say, they do. When we say, you are hungry, they'll go search for food. When we say, you are full, they stop eating. When we want something, they crave for it. Best part is, we're going to control how they feel. The serotonin, we're not going to let them produce it. 90% of the serotonin, we're going to produce it in ourselves. We're going to control how they feel. And that's how the microbiome, your microbe in your gut, is controlling the human beings. That's how the world works. So now that I've told you, <laughs> what? That's how we were created. Now what do we do about it? So why am I telling you this story? Is it's not us, it's them. When we are sick, it's because our guests that are in our gut are not taking good care of us. And you know why not taking good care of us? Because we're not taking good care of them. So when our guests are not taken care of, what happens? They release these enzymes and toxins that are absorbed in our blood. And what happens? Our immune system, 70% of our immune system is our gut lining. Our system gets inflamed. We get leaky gut. These toxins are changing our gene expression. So our microbiome changes the gene expression of our cells. Here's very interesting research I found. Every single chronic disease, so you can Google anyone you want, Parkinson's and microbiome. You Parkinson's, Alzheimer, autism, depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, ADHD, obesity, autoimmune diseases, diabetes, and cancer is caused and influenced by your microbiome. So much so, even the cure for cancer, whether it works or does not work, depends on microbiome. In fact, if you Google immunotherapy and microbiome, they will tell you whether the immunotherapy works or does not work, depends on your microbiome. Whether the cancer, chemotherapy works or does not work, depends on your microbiome. Cleveland Clinic published a research about two, uh, two months ago that says the breast cancer is caused by the microbiome. They took 1,600 breast uh, cancer tissues and found the microbiome. Interesting thing is microbiome is so important when the baby is born not only everyone in the medical field today believes that baby in the womb is completely sterile. Wow, you got everything there. <laughs> Good website. Uh, I didn't even know you had a website there. Uh, so everything, <laughs> everything that, you know, med current doctor, when you ask them, they will tell you that baby in the womb is completely sterile. The amniotic acid, the placenta is completely sterile. Right. Month ago, it was changed. They actually published the research in a full-term baby. 
that shows the placenta has a microbiome, amniotic acid has microbiome, and the baby has microbiome. And in fact, when the, when the baby is born, all the labor that you get, that's not a nature way of punishing the mother. That is a way of microbiome moving to the birth canal. And that's when the baby is, goes through the birth canal is how the baby is exposed to the microbiome. Interestingly, the first seven days of the breast milk has colostrum. It cannot be digested by the human body. It can only be digested by the microbiome in the gut. So imagine what nature is telling us. The offspring that I just created, the only way I can keep it healthy is to not even feed it, but feed them. Because if they are healthy, the offspring will be healthy. And that breast milk has full microbiome of the mother and antibodies. So when a lot of the people are essentially now selling the uh, mother's ma uh, milk to other people, just realize what's happening. You're taking someone else's microbiome, someone else's antibodies, all of them are there. In fact, when you get the blood transfusion, the blood is not sterile either. They check for diseases. They don't check for microbiome. You're getting someone else's microbiome. And I know some people who got the stem cell transplant done outside the country um, and got completely massive autoimmune disease because they got someone else's microbiome. The immune system actually uh, caused massive amount of infection. The reason I'm telling you is that once you know that, life got really simple. Because if your microbiome is what controls us, how do you know what is going on inside your gut? And you go back to 2,000 years ago, what one of the philosophers said. <clears throat> Hippocrates said 2,000 years ago, all disease start in the gut. That's what he said. And you know, second thing he says, one man's food is other man's poison. There is no such thing as universal healthy diet. A diet that's good for you is not good for me. And a diet that's good for me today won't be good for me in three months. Because as you start to change your diet, your microbiome changes and it becomes different. And then you have to readjust and retune your diet. And constantly you have to retune. Get, remember, there used to be seasons. People used to eat different food in different seasons. Now we have the whole foods and Safeway and QFCs where you get the same food 12 months a year. We can't have the same diet all the time. So what we did at Wyom was very interesting. We says, what if, remember the technology we got from the Los Alamos National Lab? They measure your RNA of every single organism in your gut. Not only who they are, what they are doing, and how active they are. Based on that, we can also look at your blood and saying, how does your body digest protein, fat, and carbohydrate? And we can tell you exactly what you should be eating and what not. I was trying to lose weight, which I still am, and I was pre-diabetic. And everyone told me the best thing I can do is to cut down all the carbs, cut down all the starch, and start eating healthy food like I need to be eating more spinach, more kale, more avocado, more oats, and cut down the gluten and everything is the enemy. And I followed that guidance. Here's what happened. First few months I've lost weight. Year later, came right back up. My glucose is back up the same. It turns out when I launched Wyom, I was the first guinea pig to do the test. It turns out my diet needs to be mostly carbs. 50% of my diet needs to be carbs. And the things I need to minimize and not eat are spinach, avocado, oats, <laughs> everything that I was doing. And it's not their bad thing. Because I was eating so much of them, my gut became totally imbalanced because I was feeding one set of bacteria and others were starving, imbalanced. So there is no such thing as good bacteria or bad bacteria. It is the ecosystem that makes them good or bad. So think of that like a rainforest. Every meter of rainforest is completely different ecosystem, yet it's all lush and green. So it can be completely different, yet lush and green. So ecosystem is what matters. So what we do is really is to keep you healthy. So when you talk about matter of choice, we tell you what is going on, and we tell you what to eat and what not to eat. You now already, You already have that information? And that it's actually already, is currently. It's commercialized? It's commercialized. Interesting thing is I launched about four months ago, 10,000 people signed up. And I'm gonna tell you some secret. We just signed Deepak Chopra, who's gonna be promoting it to his 15 million followers. Dr. Oz just recorded a show two days ago, is gonna be going live in two weeks. Two women that we did not know did the test and went on Dr. Oz 
one lost 70 pounds, and she says, she posted on her Facebook, actually, you can go see it. She says, I was one week away from getting a getting, uh, gastric bypass surgery. I decided the last resort, I'm going to try Wyom. I lost 70 pounds. We didn't, we don't, we're not a weight loss diet. We don't do anything weight loss. She had a leaky gut, and she had inflammation. We fixed her gut, and the symptom went away. Other women said, I was depressed, and I had acne, and all anxiety. We didn't focus on anxiety or depression or anything else. We fixed our gut, the symptoms went away. So point is, these are just the symptoms. We don't go out and say, what symptoms are we working on? We simply say, let's fix the gut, and amazing things happen. I, uh, I'm gonna sign up tomorrow. How, so much does it, how much does it cost to do So interestingly, it used to cost $10,000. When we launched four months ago, we launched at $9.95. We do it now $3.99, right? And I'm gonna do something, if I could do, I'm going to give everyone $100 off. I don't know how yet, but I'm going to offer. <laughs> I'm going to find a code. Give us a code. Give I'm going to give you a code. Um, and give me, about 20, give me about 12 hours to make sure that I can go back and call someone to make it happen. What would you like the code to be? Secret Fight. code that only you know. Fight on. Or no, how about uh, uh, BAE or the LEAP? LEAP. LEAP. L-E-A-P. So LEAP is going to be the code. And when you go to wyom.com slash LEAP, you're going to get $100 off, right? And it's going to be $299. I'll do it. Right? And anyone you want, your family, anyone can sign up. For the next seven days, I'll keep the code active. So it's going to be for seven days, ym.com slash leap. Get anyone you want. It's a, a courtesy, of, uh, courtesy of your professor here. You, <laughs> and you, he will pay for everyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's open up the question there. We, you know, now we're going to do a Q&A finally. He said, he said he wanted to hear from you, so let's, uh, let's get some questions. So you went to IIT. Yes. And clearly you weren't an entrepreneur once you graduated. You've been through small positions and built your way up. Mm -hmm. Where did you start that got you this entrepreneurial, not mindset, but spirit? Actually, uh, I was at Microsoft for about six years. And I probably, uh, at that, the best times that Microsoft had ever seen from 1989 to 1996. You know, Microsoft was, you know, it was a tiny company when I joined, and by the time we launched Windows 95, it just took off. The stock was on rocket ship. I made about a million dollars or so from the Microsoft stock, and after tax, we got some money. And one day, I just quit my job. And I came home and I told my wife I quit my job. And she said, what do you mean by you quit your job? And I said, like, no more paycheck. <laughs> uh, she was not happy. She said, I am pregnant. You are an irresponsible husband. How, you're not a single anymore. You got to take care of the family. You can't just quit your job. Call them and tell them that you want your job back. And I said, look, uh, what are you going to be doing otherwise? I said, I really don't know what I'm going to be doing yet. But I know, I can, you know, internet is this thing just is starting out. There are only four companies, Yahoo, Lycos, you don't remember Lycos, Magellan, and Excite. Those were the only companies on the internet at that time. No, no Alta Vista, no Inktami, no all these guys, no Facebook, no MySpace. And I said, there's something happening here. The people are starting to build this thing. I'm going to go do something on the internet. And, and that's what I did. So I spent the whole weekend looking for something to do. And I found a website that actually was doing something called white pages and yellow pages company, a thing called Switchboard. And I'm thinking, that's a great idea. It's probably some goddamn uh, you know, uh, idiot run, running it. I can probably do much better than that. And that's my thing. I always feel that I can do better. So just to make sure that I was absolutely convinced I could do better, I picked up the phone and called the CEO. And I said, sir, I like the business you are in, and I sure, I'm sure you have a family. I just want to give you a warning. Your company is going to go out of business. If I were you, I'll start looking for a job. <coughs> and he said, how are you going to do that? And I said, that's really easy. When you go home, the call you did not make, I'm going to be making that call. And when you come home, when you come to work, the call you are about to make, I already made that call. I'm going to work harder than you ever did, and I'm going to be smarter than you ever be, and I'm going to drive you out of business. And just to show you, I bought the damn thing just to spite the out of them after that when I became successful. <laughs> I just wanted them to know there's only one boss. 
right. Thank you, sir. And by the way, I had no success at that time. I mean, I was the first time entrepreneur, right? And you know, I'm going to tell you one interesting thing is I started with that and then I moved to smartphones. And this is really interesting. And those days in two year 98, I took the company public based on the fact that someday they're going to be smartphones. Steve Jobs launched the smartphones in 2007. And if you are interested, you can read my interview in year 2000 in Washington Post with a woman named Leslie Walker. And here's what the interview says. One day, we're going to have a phone that's going to have your email and contact and stock codes. And you're going to be able to use your phone to make the payment instead of credit card. And when you drive by the Starbucks, you're going to get a Starbucks coupon. And the lady says, not in our lifetime. And I called her seven years later when the iPhone came out. I hope you're still alive because it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and you know, you're thinking that how did I come up with this brilliant idea that this is going to happen? It wasn't something because I had some crystal ball, I'm any smarter. So I'm going to tell you how you think and why it happened. So two things were happening. In those days, everyone had this flip phone. The best phone was the Motorola Star Trek that you flip phone and there was two lines of display. And people used to carry Palm Pilots. How many know Palm Pilots? Oh my God, this is smart class. So Palm Pilots, they used to write on that, there was an email, contact, and calendar, and people used to carry pagers. Have you seen those pagers? <coughs> right? People used to carry them. And I started to think about it. They have three devices. They have this phone, they have Palm Pilots, and a pager. They need to come together. And everyone, when I said, you're going to have your email on a phone, people are thinking, well, how can that two-line phone ever have your email or a stock quote or anything else? And I was thinking, why can't the Palm Pilot have a phone in it? Right, so that was the only change. I'm thinking Palm Pilot can become a phone, and they were thinking the phone is going to stay a phone, and everything has to go on that flip phone. And that is what my uh, aha moment was. And the second thing, the reason I decided to do what, I was traveling from San Francisco to Seattle one day, and I had this pretty girl sitting next to me, and if you have a pretty girl sitting next to me, you chat with her, right? So I'm asking her, hey, what, what are you working on? She said, I'm at AT&T, what do you do there? Uh, we're working on some, uh, a secret project. Come on, I see, you, you and I don't know each other, you can tell me what you're working on. <laughs> <laughs> she says, we're going to build a phone that's going to be able to dial like a modem onto the internet, and we're going to be able to get two lines of information that you can send back, a tiny information, but you're going to be able to connect to the internet and get a tiny bit of information back. So I, I said, oh, I got the white pages, yellow pages. Won't you want people to know? Type in the name, and I can get you the phone number. He said, that would be an amazingly great service. We would like that. I said, can you connect me to the boss? And that's how I started working with AT&T. And now, interesting thing is, the boss calls me one day. He says, you know, we have a problem. Because when you do the phone service, people are going to think we are taking their phone number and displaying them, and they're going to be really upset. So we can't launch it under AT&T brand. You have to use your own brand. And we have to put your brand right on the box to say it's not our service, it's your service. And I said, twist my arm hard. Put my brand right on the top of that. <laughs> 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 and that's how we launched the company. <laughs> huh? Infospace was the company. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Yeah, so uh, I saw a video on YouTube of you. Um, it's titled How to Be a Billionaire. And you were um, talking about, like, the importance of soul, body, and mind. Yes. I saw in the video like you were living a nice like life, and you had like really nice cars and like a red Ferrari, and you were like really enjoying life. Can you elaborate a little bit like, um, like ah. how how like what's the importance of of uh, starting your morning off like with. Uh, Maybe starting off with your emails, like you said, and then like start exercised in soul. Mm -hmm. Maybe talk a little bit about that. So first of all, um, you know, um, he's talking about a, a movie that in UK TV came and did a movie. And I don't know why the hell they renamed it How to Be a Billionaire. That wasn't <laughs> the title they told me. It was all about the mindset of thinking, audacious thinking. And it's a great, by the way, the documentary is not that bad. But if you want to watch, I did a very recent podcast with Lewis House. Um, uh, you should watch it. Really good about 
uh, uh, thinking un unachieve uh, thinking unachievable lewis l e w i s house h o w e s so just type naveen jain lewis house and you would watch on youtube it's called uh, thinking unachievable i think it's really good about the mindset that you will really enjoy but coming back to it the reason i think is really a, you know generally everyone ask about these uh, you know what are the habits that you have and i want to understand those habits and the rituals and i really think that's the dumbest question people ask <laughs> and here is why because you want never to follow somebody's rituals and habits you want to follow their thought process for example tony robbins takes a ice bath every day you can take your ice bath three times a day, you're not gonna become Tony Robbins, right? <laughs> right. So point is following someone's ritual doesn't make who they are. F thinking like Tony Robbins makes you Tony Robbins. Think the thought process and the mindset. So if you ask me how I think, I can tell you that. Telling you what I do in the morning is not gonna get you to become anything, right? But the idea is that, you know, to some extent what I do do, which I think I think you can benefit from is always take inventory every day when I go to sleep. I, when I go to sleep, I spend five minutes in my prayer room just looking at the day and asking myself, am I better off today, either intellectually the things I learned that I didn't know, am I better off emotionally the things I did not deal with, I de dealt better today, or spiritually the things I did today that I never thought I would do. Right. So if I'm better off every day, I feel blessed and I always count my blessing every day. Remember the gratitude. The gratitude is the most amazing thing that's going to bring happiness. If I may say so, just to continue on your thoughts, sir, is that happiness is a choice. Happiness is not something that happens to you. Happiness is a choice you make. It doesn't matter what is happening. You can think of a 10 reasons why your life is amazing. It doesn't matter what is going on, you can find 10 reasons why you should be happy. And it doesn't matter how good your life is, you can always find 10 reasons why your life absolutely sucks and why you should be unhappy. That's the choice you make. Bill Gates may have a great life, but he probably cries every day because he's no longer the richest man, right? <laughs> he could, but he's not. Point is, that's the choice you make. You can always find something that other people have that you don't, but you can focus on what you have and be feel blessed. The best thing I find that gives me the most amount of pleasure, and try that. Do something for someone without expecting anything back. No transaction. Never expect transaction. When you do a transaction with someone, that, that will never bring you happiness. Do something for someone, say, can I help you? Or pay for someone behind you in the Starbucks and just walk away. You don't have to even tell them who they are, you are. And that would ch start the chain of reaction of people helping each other. An amount of satisfaction you get. Just do that. It's amazing to see when you help people and don't ask anything back. or Not ask, expect anything back. It's going to be amazing things. Yeah. You'd mentioned something about the American dream. I was wondering... Do you still believe the American dream is available? And if not, where do you think it exists? So American dream has become the universal dream. The dream that we had here is now in China and India and Brazil. Every humans want to have that American dream. Now, to some extent, we have lost a lot of what made America great. What made America great were simple things. We attracted the best and the brightest. We gave them so much opportunity to succeed. We call this a land of opportunity. And the thing that we did best, when they succeeded, we celebrated their success. Today, we don't want people best and the brightest coming to our country. We want to close our borders. And if they come in there, we put every hurdle in their way to make sure they can't succeed. And if they succeed, we tell them you are a corrupt 1%. You don't belong to our society because you are a one percenter. You don't belong to us. That's not what America was about. America used to look up to people who were successful and say, I want to be just like you. They never looked at them and saying, damn you. That's not the America I know. And that's not the America we want. And I'm not even running for political office. <laughs> right. 
But to me, the American dream is alive and well. And we together will continue to achieve it because we are not going to allow. So here's a very interesting thing. The governments are starting to become irrelevant. The entrepreneurs are going to become the next superpower. And the nation states are going to become irrelevant. And I wrote an article on CNBC about it, how and why entrepreneurs are going to be the next superpower. And I can you know, give it to you, uh, or just shoot me an email, and, because I want to make sure I answer more of your question. But just remember, entrepreneurs are going to be the next superpowers, and nation states are going to be irrelevant. So it doesn't really matter what they do, because we are going to control the de our own destiny, and the society is going to control their own destiny. And if you have any question, I'm going to give you my email. Just send the email to me, my first name, dot last name, naveen.jain, J-A-I-N, at gmail.com. And I only get about 1,000 emails a day, so another 200 is not going to kill me. <laughs> All right. All right, Naveen, I have, Mike, I have three questions yeah. which are around the same vein. So one, have you ever dealt with, dealt with self-doubt? And how did you overcome it? Two. How many unsuccessful ideas have you had? Hmm? And what did you do about them? And three, what have been your biggest failures? And how have you overcome them? So there's never a day when you don't run through the self-doubt. The, so I don't, you know, if I were to tell you that I never doubt myself, I would actually be lying to myself. Because you doubt every single day that would this actually work? Would I be able to make this happen? Um, and the things I can tell you, that actually never worries me. What worries me is the 65 people or the 70 people who work in the company who believe in me not to screw this up. Right? So my biggest burden is if this company does not work, my life will be just as amazing as it has always been. But those 70 people that work in the company, they're, they're depending on me not to fuck up. And that's just a too much responsibility. Just way too much responsibility. And that's where I get the self-doubt that am I doing the right thing? Um, would I actually be able to make it happen? And the reason I keep moving forward is, again, the way I get over that is that every decision I make, I always believe, given the information, I'm doing absolutely the best I can. So the two things I learned about life, I never worry about the things that I can't control. Because I have nothing I can do about it. It's out of my control. And I never worry about the thing that I actually can control because I'm doing the darndest I can. Every single thing I can do, I do my best every day. So I don't worry about it. It will be what will be. Right? So I don't worry about what the outcome is. The reason is, other things is when the things are really, really bad. And I just ask myself the same question, and I get the answer. When things are really bad, and I all say, if God has given me this, if this is the worst thing that God has in mind for me, I have lived a great life. I'm not going to worry about it. And when you ask yourself that, oh my God, my boyfriend just bro broke up and my girlfriend just broke up, you say, if this is the worst thing that's going to happen to me, have I lived a good life? And the answer is, there are plenty of fish in that water. <laughs> <laughs> That was a delayed reaction there. <laughs> Thank you for coming in. Uh, you're a very inspiring person. Um, so you talked about how you were always on the lookout for like new technology, and you uh, said it's advisable to like look out to the future and be like, what's the new thing going to be? Do you have anything in mind, any field or any new technology that you're particularly interested in at this point? Yeah. So first of all, let me just give you the process of how I go about it, and then I'm going to answer your question specifically about uh, the, the technologies. Um, so what I do is um, every day, I spend the first three hours of my day, and I'm not suggesting you get up at 4 AM, but I do get up at 4 AM. Right? But I get up very early in the morning at 4 AM, and I spend the first three hours uh, going through all the scientific discoveries that happen. And the way I do that is in my Twitter feed, 
I follow every science journal. I don't care whether it's nanotechnology or neuroscience or genetics. I follow everything. I want to know what is going on, what are the latest discovery. Why do I do that? Every time I read something, I'm collecting the dots, and I keep collecting these dots. And when I see the missing dot, I say, aha, now I can solve the problem that I have been thinking about. And I'll give you some idea about how that works. So I was at NASA uh, at J J JPL, at Jet Propulsion Lab in your neighborhood. And um, I was just, a, went to the tech transfer office, I said, what kind of technology you guys here? And I'm just looking for some you know, great technology you guys may have developed for space that I can use. And they always, some uh, smart ass will you know, say, oh, we got Hubble telescope, are you interested in that? <laughs> but they never expect an answer to say, I think I'm actually interested in that, so tell me more. And when I, they start describing, I say, you know, can you tell me how do you detect the faintest light coming from a very distant star and know actually what is going on? He said, oh, you want me to tell you about the delta doped UV sensor? I said, that one, yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> and now they're describing that how they're able to take a UV light and it can be very, very faint and they can still make sense of it. And it occurred to me that I was reading a science journal about six months ago that says every bacteria when you put a UV light to it, it has an autofluorescence, very, very faint autofluorescence. And I'm thinking, wow, that means when I am sick, if I spit and I can put this camera on top of that, it will tell me if I have a bacterial infection or viral infection. So I say, can't you detect the bacterial infection from that? Sure we can, but why would you want to? Because they don't think like that. I say, what would it take for you to build me a tiny camera that can show me that you can actually do that? That's going to cost $50,000. I say, here's $50,000. Go show it to me. <laughs> right? Point was, I wanted to see can they actually do that, and they build a prototype. Now, think about it. We just saw, we could potentially solve one of the biggest problems facing humanity, the overdose of antibiotics. People creating a, a antibiotics-resistant bacteria. Right? So my point is, if I was not reading a journal that was completely useless thing about bacteria having a protein that is autofluorescence, I would have never been able to connect that dot. Now, answering your uh, question about what technology I'm really, really excited about, if you think about it, <coughs> what are the biggest problems that are facing humanity? The bigger the problem, bigger the opportunity. Right? So never think of a problem our social problem as a non-profit thing. If you want to do a small good in the world, you become a social entrepreneur. You become a non-profit. If you want to do a large good in the world, you create a profitable enterprise. Profit is what allows you to scale. If you can do a good for 1,000 people and make money so you can do a good for 100,000 people and then do a good for 10 million people and do a good for a billion people, you need to profit. Even if you are the richest man in the world, you're going to go bankrupt if you, by the time you can get to a billion people, you're going to run out of money. You need to create profit. What are the biggest problems? Lack of food, lack of fresh water, lack of energy. What if you can create abundance of energy, abundance of food, abundance of water, what if you can solve the crisis of healthcare, the crisis of education, the crisis of poverty? And you say, how can that possibly happen? And I can give you how to do that too. So you look at energy. Every 90 minutes, more solar energy falls on planet Earth than we use in the whole year. It's simply the conversion problem. Today, the best solar cell converts about 20, 21% efficiency. That's going to go up. Now imagine what happens. Um, you know what used to be the most precious metal about a couple of hundred years ago? Most precious metal 200 years ago. Huh? <coughs> Platinum, copper, it used to be aluminum. Aluminum is in abundance on planet Earth, but it's never in the pure form. It's always in the form of bauxite. It used to be so precious that when Napoleon hosted the king of Siam, he wanted to show his wealth. He fed all his generals in the gold, plat, gold platter, all his troops in the silver platter. But for the king of Siam, he fed him in the aluminum platter. He wanted him to know, I am the rich king here. In fact, the 
top of the Washington Monument is made out of aluminum. We wanted to show the Britishers, we have arrived. We are not a poor country anymore. F you. That was the tip of aluminum. <laughs> right? It was simply what happened. A technology called electrolysis came about that made aluminum so cheap to extract from bauxite, it would throw it away. What would be the electrolysis of the solar energy that will fundamentally change it? And if you do that, think what happens. When you have abundance of energy, and it becomes free. And you could solve a world peace. What do we fight over? We fight over land, water, and we fight over energy. People say the humans are so greedy, it doesn't matter how much we have, we will always fight over it. And I can tell you that is just not true. We are all sitting in this room, breathing the same air, same oxygen. We are not fighting over it. Why is that? Because we actually believe it's in abundance. We don't believe the air or the oxygen is scarce, so we don't fight over it. What if the energy became so abundant, just it became the next air, it became free. And when you have a free energy, what happens? Even the dirtiest water, you can distill it, and it becomes a free, fresh water. What if you have a free, fresh water, and you have free energy? Could you have abundance of food? Even today, when people talk about environment, how many of you actually care about environment here? Everyone. And you, prob you probably believe that all of the things we are doing, like driving the fossil cars instead of electric cars, we are damaging the environment, right? No? Good. That's good. You know what the biggest damage to the environment is caused by? Cattles. Cattles. Cattle breathing is the biggest damage we do to the environment, the methane that the cattle produce. And I'm not even saying, if you care about the environment, you would be just one day a week, you don't eat beef, you would do more for the environment than driving Tesla. Right? I am a vegetarian, I get to drive a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> But my point is, uh, you, can so you can solve many of these problems. So point is, you can, you know, if you want to solve the problem, you start to think about where the problem exists, right? So when people say we, want, we don't have enough fresh water, fresh water is used, majority of fresh water is used for agriculture. What if you can make aquaponic or aeroponic agriculture that are lightly salted? Uh, seeds that can be lightly salted, water, use lightly salted water. You'll have plenty of fresh water. Until you realize most of the agriculture is used to feed the cattle. All you have to do is create the beef synthetically. What if you can take a stem cell of the cow and only create muscle tissues? He's coming, that's okay. I'm done, <laughs> almost done. But create the muscle tissues that you can eat and you can create the bio factories of the beef without ever having to raise the cattle and you can solve that problem. So anyway, it's such great advice. There's so much that we learned. And you have his email, so you could ask him more questions. This is like uh, Bill Maher, after hours on, uh, on Bill Maher. We can follow up with our questions. For USC's up seven with two minutes to go, in case you're wondering, uh, over Stanford. But it's close. It's getting closer. Um, what are you going to remember from this? I'm going to learn so much oh. on the science side. He just has a voracious curiosity. It seems like not only does he like want to learn more, but he digest, digests it. And, and really Good seems microbiome. to know it, and seems to know it. <laughs> so in five years, what are you going to remember from our talk with Naveen? That's actually the good thing. What is one thing that you would do differently? <laughs> one what do you want? One thing you'll do One thing you would okay, do differently. Okay, one thing you'll do differently, or one thing you learn? Well, if they learn, they don't do it, doesn't really matter. That's they right. have to follow okay, it. Okay, <laughs> well, this is the, the, what they're going to follow. Are yeah. Ready? <laughs> Who's ready? Who's ready? Go. You might have a lot, but if you don't create something, you ain't shit. Good. <laughs> The only way you can pay it back is to pay it forward. Say it again, Lord. The only way you can pay it back is to pay it forward. Burn the bridge behind you. Before you start something, assume it will be successful. Failure is when you give up. Life of an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur is like a heartbeat. If it's flat, that means you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> Stand where the ball is going to be, not where it is. 
If you're a vegetarian, you can drive a Ferrari. Illness is optional. Say it again. Illness is optional. Illness is optional. Work on ideas that will move the needle. Do things that push the needle for humanity. Success is about how many lives you can help. Gratitude brings happiness. Sure does. Listen to your gut, literally. <laughs> Take it one slice at a time. You become humble when you're successful. Live for something you die for. Excellent. Good to see you, buddy. All right, come around. Go into an industry with no experience. <laughs> Do something for someone without asking for anything in return. Great advice. Making money is a byproduct of doing what you love. Don't follow people's habits, follow their thought process. I won't be cocky and, and I will prepare for the winter better. <laughs> Every idea that doesn't work is a stepping stone to a different and better idea. Excellent. Happiness is a choice you make. Coming up. Burn the bridge to keep moving forward. You got it. Stand where the ball is going to be, not where it is. The bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity. Entrepreneurs don't fail, they pivot. Excellent. Take self inventory every night. I miss anybody? One more. Do something that'll affect a billion people. You do something that'll affect a billion people. One more. The day you become humble is the day you become successful. Let's hear it and thank Naveen James. Oh.